I can't hear a word you're saying right now. Welcome to the countdown. I'm Casey Kasem. Somehow we are both Casey Kasem. Casey, welcome to the show. Thank you, Casey. (laughs) Where are we on the countdown this week? Uh, Coming up next is the British band (laughs) with the French name, with their first American hit, People Are People. That would be Depeche Mode. You have to say it like it's French. (laughs) I remember he did that. They are Depeche Mode. The song is 3 minutes and 42 seconds long, which leaves me just enough time to bang my wife, Jean Casey. (laughs) Okay, thank you for that information, Casey. (laughs) All right, let's start this thing up. Take it away, announcer man. You're listening to the Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Wait, are you, are you waiting for me? Hold tight. Is- and now here's your host, Big Anklevich. Cool, baby. And Rish Outfield. Strange but not a stranger. I'm an ordinary guy. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Episode 79, page number nobody cares anymore, I guess. They never cared. Yeah. I am oh. Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Wipe that smile off your face. Sorry. Okay, say it more soberly. I am Rish Outfield. And I'm Big Anklevich. Welcome to the countdown. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> ah, today we've got a story for you. I know, it's a big shock, isn't it? Today's story would be This Must Be the Place by Elliot Bangs. Elliot Bangs lives in Seattle, Washington, where he keeps his day job, but dreams of being a full-time writer someday soon. This story originally appeared in Strange Horizons in February 2009 and is his first professional publication. He has succeeded in building a website for himself. It is elbangs.com. Rockin'. Be sure you enter that URL correctly because you might... You get some of that Tolkien pornography if you put elf bangs in there. You might wind up at the website that I accidentally wound up at. And uh, yeah. Anyways, on with the countdown. Today's music is the source of rejuvenescence by Reju... Les Paulines Disco by J.C. Pierre and Francois Roland. And she could be in the Beatles shooting up the charts to number three by the Modest Lads. Uh, we'd also like to thank Brian Lincoln for producing this week's episode, R.E. Chambliss for narrating today's story, and Abigail Hilton for also lending her voice to today's story. And you can check out links to all of them in the show notes. This Must Be the Place, by Elliot Bangs. It's probably simplest to say I first met Lauren Wells in a club in San Francisco. We'll set aside for the moment that it wasn't the first time he'd met me. It wasn't the best night of my life. I could barely remember the names of the people who had dragged me there. My borrowed dress was heavy with perspiration and self-consciousness. And in the throes of waning drunkenness, I was now scouring my memory for any time when I'd been lonelier. I'd just come from drifting in a jet-lagged haze through three days of bar graph presentations to lecherous executives and their nose-picking underlings. I'd just been dumped from a distance of 2,580 miles. I was sleepless and tired. And no matter how I've always prided myself on needing nothing from anyone, All I'd wanted at the outset of that stupid night was a few degrees of human warmth as I nodded off. I hadn't cared how I got it. Three hours of bad pickup lines later, having realized that I did care after all, I first laid eyes on Lauren in the suffocating underground of the club. 
and something about him put me naturally at ease. Maybe he looked as out of place there as I felt. Maybe his goofy grin had a depth and a sincerity that shone straight through the shallow lying crowd. Maybe it was just fate. The first thing he said to me was hard to forget. Did you ever hear the one about the two brothers who loved baseball? He asked me, out of the blue, seeming to swallow something as he did. What? I said in shock. He grinned wordlessly. That's my favorite joke, I said, over the throbbing music and the chatter of cocaine conversation. How did you... Oh, we've met, he said. Oh, geez, I said apologetically. I'm sorry, I don't remember. He showed me a dismissive smirk and told me his name. Lauren Wells. And you're Andrea, right? He added, though I was sure he was faking his uncertainty. Yeah, I said. When did we meet? It couldn't have been here in San Fran. He shook his head and said nothing. We chatted long enough for me to see the wit in him. He was confident, too, but it was more than that. All the awkward carefulness that shrouds the interactions of strangers was strangely absent between us. I racked my brain for a clue as to where I'd seen him before, but I was pretty sure I never had. After a while, even as sick and sober as I was, I started to think of inviting him back to the hotel. I didn't say anything. But something shifted between us. Every trace of affection made him recoil a bit further until he evaporated into the alcoholic haze from whence he'd come, leaving me to nurse my assumptions for a while and then catch a cab. He'd left me only one trace of his existence, an enigmatic inscription on a paper napkin. I love you, Photon, 15 dash Toynbee, slash 2245 slash May 12. For its sheer bizarrity and believing I'd never see him again, I kept it. I gave it its own pocket in my briefcase and took it out on the lunch hours of particularly corporate days. I took weird solace in it whenever the universe felt oppressively predictable. That was February. By the 12th of May, it had been a while since I'd needed the napkin of mystery. Things had shaped up, and my life in New York had become bearable again. Or at least, the new guy I was dating was enough to distract me from the fact that it hadn't. Bud was a man who lived for bizarreties, and I always struggled to impress him. So when the date finally came around, I told him the story of the stranger in the club and showed him the napkin note. Bogus! He exclaimed. I know that place! What place? I asked. 15th Street and Toynbee Avenue! Photon! It's a disco! Used to go there all the time! The gears in my head ground to a halt. Well then, what's 2245? I said. He munched contemplatively for a while, and then said, Military time! 10.45 p.m. I didn't know what to think. Unraveling the enigma felt like sacrilege. We have to go there, Bud said suddenly. And although nothing in me really wanted to pursue this, I knew just by watching him slurp down the brown milk that there would be no curbing his curiosity. pushed through the lacquered doors at 10.45 on the dot. Sure enough, Lauren was there. And yet, also not. Someone who looked exactly like him was there, 
bathed in splinters of light from the mirror ball whirling above his head. But he was different. He looked younger now. And all the suave he'd once had was missing along with the years. His dancing was rhythmless, spastic, weird. People were giving him a wide berth. Go, talk to him, said Bud, pressing me forward. Why should I, I groaned. You want to spend the rest of your life wondering what was up with this creep? He bellowed. There's a mystery to be solved. Hop to it. So, when the song ended, I rolled my eyes and stepped up to the sweat-polished Lauren Wells look-alike and uttered a distrustful, Hello. Hi. He said, between heaved breaths. I waited uneasily. Do I know you? He asked. You're Lauren Wells, I said. How do you know that? Where do you know me from? You never told me where you knew me from. I protested. He could have been looking at an impossible math equation. I was sure he didn't recognize me at all. Then a spark of realization crossed his face, and he said, cautiously, You have me confused with somebody. Sorry. With that, he started to crawl back into the crowd. You gave me this note, I called. I held the napkin out to him. He hesitantly came back and stared at it, never touching it. Great Scott, he said gravely. You gave me this note, I repeated, in San Francisco. Do you want to talk about something? No, he said, and started slinking away again. Hey, I said and knew that Bud had finally succeeded in infecting me with the rabies of his curiosity. If if I gave it to you in San Francisco, ask me in San Francisco. Lauren whispered anxiously. Not here. Now, leave me alone. He didn't bury himself in the crowd this time. We chased him back outside to an enormous motorcycle at the curb. A moment later, our ears ringing from the loud pipes, All we could do was watch his taillights flit into the rain-greased night. How in God's name did I end up in a relationship with this man? And yet, it happened. June found me in an Oakland hotel room on another inane errand, again with no one waiting for me in New York. All Bud had left me was a heap of dirty bowls and spoons, a crap sci-fi paperback, and that same old case of rabies. After the last bar graph was projected and the last nose picked, I had nothing else to do. So I crossed the bridge to San Fran and went back to the bar stool where I'd first met the Enigma. When I didn't find him, I took a shot of liquid confidence and told the bartender I was Lauren's sister, very worried about my missing twin. Impossibly, it worked. She said Lauren had been there almost every night throughout the month of February, but had then disappeared. But she knew a regular there, a sequin-scaled scarecrow of a girl, who knew the building where Lauren lived. It turned out to be only a block away. What the hell was I doing? I asked myself more than once. But haven't you ever needed to follow a mystery past all the limits of common sense? Have you ever found yourself in a whole awful prison of a world in which every last familiar and sensible thing has finally come up hollow and pointless? Have you ever been left with nothing on which to stake all your hopes of transcendence, save one good leap into the abyss? It also suffices to say that the story would have ended here if it hadn't been for alcohol. He buzzed me up. But when I knocked on his door, I heard his drunken voice say, Oh, jeez, I made a mistake. You can't come in. You have to go away. What? I squawked. No, no, stay. Come in, he said. 
The door jerked open onto a landscape of squalor bathed in the eerie twilight of MTV. I made a mistake, he said again, wiping his mouth on his yellow polyester sleeve. Looking at him again, I was certain I'd been right. The unsteady, booze-reeking Lauren I now beheld was years older than the one I'd seen only weeks ago. Mistakes, I mumbled through my own intoxication, my thoughts lost in the disorder around me. Uh, I know, he groaned. A lot of them, a lot, a lot, a lot of mistakes. Such as I thought you were the July you. I, I mean, sometimes I get a little confused, you know? I didn't know what he was talking about. I didn't ask. I, I knew that you were coming back, he said. But why are you here? Well, I paused. Wait, how did you know I was coming back? Because I didn't explain it to you last time. What you knew is what, what, what you'll know in July. And I didn't explain it to you then. I, I mean, I, I won't then. So it had to be now. He paused to perform some invisible calculation on his fingers. But I guess it has to be tonight, or, or soon, that I explain it to you. Explain what? I demanded. He ignored me and continued, pressing his palms to his eyes in anguish. Oh, but I shouldn't tell you at all. But I don't have a choice. If I don't tell you now, I'll just wind up telling you later. He hiccuped and finished somberly. And uh, I, I should let you go. I won't make you come back again against your will. How could you do that? I asked with a mocking snicker. Because it all evens out, he said. History. He plopped down on a pile of clothes by the window while his hands searched for a bottle that still had anything in it. I cleared a space on his couch and waited in suspense. He told me. I'm from the future, Andrea. I laughed a little. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. I'm from the future. The future, the future, the future, I echoed, imitating a movie preview. Exactly, he said. The future. I'm a time traveler. I, I mean, kind of. Kind of? Well, in a way, he said between sips. In, in, in a way, I'm the only person who isn't moving through time. Uh, what I mean is, riddle me this, Andrea. Well, what would you do if, uh, say you stole a time machine? Stole it? <laughs> who, who cares how you got it? Say you had a time machine. Well, what would you do with it? Jeez, I said. I don't know. Um, go back and assassinate Hitler or... Well, but what if you couldn't? Why couldn't I? Paradoxes. I, you know, I explained it to you years ago. Too drunk to do it now. Just, you can't change anything. You, you just can't. Everything evens out so that you can't. Not, not if you already know it happened. Not if that's your reason for changing it. Okay. So, what would you do with a time machine? Fine, I said. I'd check out the future. No, 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 no. The, the future is a stupid place. You wouldn't want to go there. Trust me. Just one look, and you turn right around. Maybe I wouldn't, I protested. You don't know me. He gave me a doomed look. I know you, he said. What do you know? I know you're a drifter, he said. Attached to nothing, attached to nobody. It's so important to you to be independent, to think you've got a thing of your own, a life to yourself, but... Is that so, I said coldly. I had stopped smiling. But, he insisted, You're not special. You're like anybody, like all those people trapped under the glass ceiling that you look down on with so much proudness that you made it through anyway, even if the price is going anywhere the company sends you. Never tied down, never really knowing anybody, ever. You're no kind of island. You've got no independence. You just want to go home, just, just like me. After gritting my teeth a while, I said, fine, what would I do with a time machine? What anybody would do if they thought it through. He said, you'd go back to the best part of history and stay there. For good, repeating that one year. It took me a moment. 
You're saying, I chuckled, you're saying that this is the high point? Yeah, he said unflinchingly. You think 1984 is the high point? You think there's never going to be a better year than this? I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Do the Soviets win or something? He laughed loudly. <laughs> Make me understand this, I said. Why is this the best year in history? He scratched his head and looked around, then smiled deviously and crawled to the television. He twisted the knob until Thomas Dolby's She Blinded Me With Science was pounding on my eardrums. Could you turn that down? I yelled. Science! He shouted with the song. Somebody hammered on the floor below us. Warren giggled stupidly and turned MTV <laughs> back down, pressing his finger to his lips. But that's it, he whispered excitedly. Don't you see? The synthesizer is still a new instrument in 1984. The computer pop of the future is dissonant, overcomplicated crap. And the movies, don't even get me started on the movies. Anybody knows. The Road Warrior was the, the high point of Gibson's career, just like Risky Business was the best Cruise ever did. And Thriller was the best song MJ ever did. The talent, the, the genius god, Andrea, the waste. They'll all go batshit crazy in your lifetime, one by one. I stared at him in disbelief <laughs> as he sat giggling by the TV. <laughs> batshit. <laughs> You're telling me, I said, that you have a time machine, and you can go anywhere in all of time and space, and you decided to use it to go back to this year and just live it over and over again? He nodded and said, Every time the clock turns on New Year's Eve, I jump backward and start my 84 over again. He smiled blissfully and added, In a different city each time. You know, so as to never meet an earlier version of myself. How many times have you done this? I guess six so far. You're saying there are six more of you out there in different cities? More than that, I hope. He said. I'm just getting started. There should be at least 50 or 60 more of me out there. He paused and said solemnly. Or that's what I would have hoped. Then he continued. You don't understand that I'm here for good. This is my home. Th this time. Why? For what? Nostalgia? It's not nostalgia. He said bitterly. I was born in 2008. How can I be nostalgic for something I never had? I did my homework, all right? I know my history backwards and forwards. This is it. This is the year. I started to say something. Shh. He said excitedly, then turned the volume on the TV up again. This is my favorite song of all time, he said. It was something by the talking heads. I sighed. The booze was wearing thin. Moment by moment, the carriage of my unwise curiosity was turning back into a pumpkin. But did I actually believe him? You just think I'm crazy, he murmured. Even if you believe me that I'm from the future, you still think I'm crazy. I shrugged. Well, maybe you should go, he said. The same words had been on the tip of my tongue, but they sounded wrong coming from him. I stood uneasily from the trashy couch and started for the door. But my hand wavered above the knob. You said you loved me, I said. He nodded and said, I... I do. You met me before, or you will. We're going to meet somewhere else. Is that what you're telling me? that I'll meet you in one of your previous repetitions in some other city, and you'll fall in love with me? He nodded. The weird electricity in that room had grown too thick for me to stand. I didn't say anything else. I just walked out.
In February, he'd been charming enough for a one-night stand at least, but seeing him in the apartment and on the dance floor in New York, I had felt no attraction to Lauren Wells. Especially if it was falling for me in some other city that would catapult him into alcoholic depression in San Francisco the following year. Or rather, the following iteration. The whole thing gave me a headache. For that reason, and others, I resolved never to talk to him again. Maybe he'd told me that the past couldn't be changed, but our relationship was still in the future from my point of view. No, I would not meet him. I certainly wouldn't date him. Then, in July, I was promoted to Chicago, and I didn't even have fake friends in Chicago. The isolation whittled away at me until, when the solo Friday nights and the bad dates had piled up to a critical mental mass, I thought that somewhere in that city was some incarnation of a man I did vaguely know. Somebody who, all complications aside, I knew could appreciate me. That's what I must have been thinking. If I had the power to decide never to meet him again, I reasoned, surely I had the power to change the course of the relationship for the better. How did I know the breakup would really be that bad? Maybe it would be bad in an epic, romantic kind of way. A Casablanca breakup. Maybe we'd make it all the way to New Year's Eve, and then he'd choose Thomas Dolby over me and regret it dearly for many 84s to come. Would that be so bad for me? I found him in the white pages and made the fateful call. Remember me? I asked. From that disco in New York? Yeah. He said. Uh, the disco in Central Park. Central Park? Never mind. I remember you. And we met in San Francisco, too, I added cautiously. Uh, I've never been there, he said. Do you want to talk about this over coffee, I asked. For a while, it even worked. He was clean. He had an ounce of sensitivity. And he was smarter than most. That was enough for me. He had other bad quirks besides his vibrant passion for pop culture, but I could relax into them. And although he always seemed faintly upset whenever I first said hi to him, he always seemed to stuff down and cheer up. He never talked about time travel, and I wasn't in a hurry to ask. You made me! One morning, we were lying awake on his bed in the middle of a boiling heat wave. I said, I know your secret, you know. He eyed me and said, I don't have secrets. You know I know, I said. What are you hiding from? Why won't you discuss it? <sighs> Humor me, he said with a sigh. Tell me what you think my secret is. So I did. Well, he said, I think that if someone did hypothetically do that, then they would be better off keeping it a secret. The whole plan would hypothetically be ruined if the media got their hands on it, say. If someone realized they could find a copy of him in every major city. Hmm, I said. But just common sense, really. He said. Temporal etiquette, one would suppose. In the sweltering heat... I shrugged and decided to live with it. We never discussed it again in Chicago. Yes, for a while it worked. Then it worked much too fast. We were together for a few months, in which time he fell hopelessly and inexplicably in love with me. As short a time as it had been, sometimes I even thought I had started to love him back. Then, that fall, it all went catastrophically wrong. It doesn't really matter what happened. I don't want to talk about it. I want to break free. I want to break free. I want to break free from your lies. You're so self-satisfied out of me. In 
In November, I didn't just accept a transfer to the company's Seattle branch. I begged for it. I pulled strings. The move was rash, heavy on desperation, and light on foresight. But at the time, it seemed like the whole breadth of Chicago stank too heinously of rotten memories. And I missed the sea. Life in Seattle wasn't bad. I walked off my psychic injuries. I cooled down. I made friends. And I knew the winter ahead of me would be dreary, but at least not too cold. By Christmas, I started to regret breaking all contact with my strange friend. It dawned on me that soon I would go on into a bold new year, while he and all his repetitions jumped back again. And if I lived to see him, it would be as an infant child of the unthinkable new millennium. I broke out the white pages again. After all, if I found him there in Seattle, he wouldn't be the same Lauren I'd left behind. Either he'd be younger, and thus innocent of our whole relationship, or he'd be older and over it. Maybe we could make some kind of amends, and then I could give him a proper send-off into the past. His name was in the phone book, but the line had been disconnected. Acceptance was never in my nature. What the heck, I thought. I talked to a private investigator. She called back the next day. I'm sure I found the fellow you were looking for. He was a friend of yours. That's what you said, correct? She asked. I froze. Was? I said. What do you mean, was? Afraid he's dead. My mind locked up but my mouth kept talking. When? How? What happened? Accident on the freeway, she told me quietly. In October, drunk driver hit his motorcycle head on. It was instantaneous. How old was he? I demanded. How old was the drunk, you mean? I said, how old was he? How old was Lauren Wells when he died? Paper fluttered on the other end of the line. Uh, thirty, said the P.I. I was silent. Listen, she said, but I hung up. Just thirty years old, I thought. No, that couldn't be. The one in Chicago was twenty-eight. That meant... Already knew what he'd tell me when I tried, but I had no choice. I couldn't do nothing. I had to warn him. Where would I find him? If I was going to try to change history, I wouldn't settle for just his death. I'd take it all back if I could. So there was no going back to Chicago, nor to the apartment of the broken-down Lauren by the bay. I needed to find the youngest one, the earliest repetition I knew of. I caught the last desperate flight to New York and picked up the first phone book I could find. A muffled hallelujah left my chapped lips when he picked up his phone and grunted hello. Lauren, it's Andrea. Remember? From the Photon Disco? What did... He groaned. I know you don't think you know me. I don't care. We have to meet. I need to tell you something. It's vital. It's four in the morning, and I shouldn't be talking to you. I'm, I'm hanging up. I shouted, You were born in 2008. You have a spoon-shaped birthmark on your left ass cheek. David Byrne is your hero. And I swear to God, if you hang up the phone, I'm going straight to 60 Minutes with the truth about you. The line sighed. We sat shivering on an icy bench in Central Park, our bloodshot eyes squinting up at the first gray rays of December twilight. After all my panicked words over the phone, the strangeness of seeing him again, knowing he had only seen me once before, 
made me eerily wordless. I didn't know where to begin. You're dead, I began. He said nothing. I continued, In Seattle, you're dead. You died in October. And I know you planned to spend the rest of your life in 1984, but the one of you that's dead and buried in Seattle was only five or six years older than you are now, just a few years into your future. He shook his head a little and just kept staring out into the chilly dark. Assuming I even know what you're talking about, he said. What do you want me to do about it? I want you to never have coffee with me. Don't ever talk to me in Chicago. And whatever you do, never ever go to Seattle. Don't you know about paradoxes? He said. You can make your own decisions. You can do it differently. And if I do, then in the next loop, you'll never find out I'm dead. You won't come here to warn me. I'll die anyway. And there'll be another loop and another and on and on until random quantum events just happen to come together in such a way that I fail to save myself even if you warn me. Stop blinding me with science. I'm trying to save your life, you idiot. The the sequence of events can only work out one way once it's made, he said. The universe writes itself. It's flawless. Trust me on this. It's too late. You've only got a few years to live and you're not going to do a thing about it? He shrugged. All the love I'd ever had for that deterministic dolt was rising to its climax at the worst possible moment. Here in New York, when he didn't even know me, didn't love me, never had, wouldn't for years of his time. I felt my eyes watering, and I wiped them hurriedly, afraid they'd freeze. In two days, it would be 1985, and he'd be nothing but a handful of missing persons across the nation and one dead body in Seattle. How did you find out about my death? He asked suddenly. A private investigator, I muttered. Did they say anything about my will? No, I said. You might want to go back and ask about it, he said. But for now, I should go. We shouldn't be having this conversation. Never should have. Bad temporal etiquette. I thought it didn't make any difference, I groaned. Makes me sad, he said. Then he started walking away from me, hands stuffed into the pockets of his yellow striped pants, back hunched over, flock of seagulls haircut gleaming in the dawn light. Hey, I said. He paused. I asked him, ever heard the one about the two brothers who loved baseball? He shook his head. It's my favorite joke, I said. It'll cheer you up. All right. He said. So I told it. Well, brother, the bad news is, you're pitching next Thursday, I finished. The time traveler cracked a smile. That was it. After the clock turned, I called the private investigator again. That's what I was going to tell you, she said. Mr. Wells doesn't have any next of kin, at all. The state was going to take everything, but then his will turned up, and it's a strange one. It only mentions one item, and it only mentions you. He gave me something? I asked. His motorcycle, she said. A Harley Davidson of unknown year and model. The impound lot didn't want to release it to me. They wanted a lot of answers. They asked me how it had come away from a head-on collision at 60 miles per without a single scratch or dent. They told me exhaustively that the impossible VIN meant I would never be able to legally register it in the state. They said they didn't know how to fill out their forms. I told them I was a lawyer. They surrendered. I bought it a monthly space in a garage downtown. Sometimes I went to visit it, 
on the lunch hours of particularly corporate days. I took solace in it whenever the universe felt oppressively predictable, or, for that matter, oppressively chaotic. I sat in the saddle and rolled on the throttle with the engine off and, for better or worse, thought about him. The universe writes itself, I echoed. That was February. Then, one day in April, I discovered the glowing control panel hidden under the seat. I found myself staring into a clock face that burned blue and crisp in the air in front of me. And as I watched a calendar etch itself out in holographic neon, I found myself thinking about how I never liked Flock of Seagulls or the Eurythmics or the Cure. I like the Beatles. Well, she's so clean and cool, she could be in the Beatles. Yeah, she walks and talks so cool, she could be in the Beatles. Author's Note The original idea behind this story must have been bouncing around in my head since about the sixth grade. Just the observation that we always seem to idealize the past or the future and keep pretty cynical towards the present partly because we're stuck with it while the past is always gone and the future never quite arrives. So I wonder just how weird it would be if one of those perspectives could get unstuck, say, if some future nostalgic person came back and told us that 2010 is the peak of all of human history. How would we take that? For me, 1984 is the perfect point to try that experiment, since, at least within the admittedly limited scope of American pop culture, I actually do consider it the single best year in history so far. But then, Lauren's character is not meant as my promotion of that idea so much as, uh, my confession. I'm Wolfman Jack. Welcome back. Yeah, I'm annoying as hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And I'm Casey Kasem, annoying in a different way. That was Elliot Bangs. She blinded me. Wait, what is this? Two? <laughs> this must be the place. Moving up three spots on the countdown. To number four this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Displacing that overplayed Kokomo by the Beach Boys. You know, they should have stayed retired. I'll have to agree with you this time, Casey. Ow! That song sucks. <laughs> oh, you know, my wife absolutely loves that Kokomo song, too. You talk about the Beach oh. Boys, and that's the first one that comes to her mind. Oh, yeah, happy. Oh, I love Kokomo. And it's oh. like, yeah. But, but. You know what? I loved Kokomo, too, in 1987, but I hate Kokomo now. Wow. So many songs should come first when you think of the Beach Boys well before Kokomo, you know? That's like me when George Harrison died, saying, oh, the guy who sang I Got My Mind Set on You. (laughs) The guy that sang Long Time Ago When We Was Fab. That was on the same album. A little less played than... Got my mind set on you. Once more, we've got some meaningless trivia for you on Casey's Top 40. (laughs) Uh, It's just banter while we're changing the records. Coming up, you'll find out. Number one, Rick Springfield is back on the charts. But it's not that one song you like. It's the one that you'll pretend you didn't know five years from now. It's They Call Me Bruce. Was, did he have a song called They Call Me Bruce? He sure did, yeah. See, I, I was going to go with Don't Talk to Strangers, but I actually like that song. Why? Wait, was this the theme song to the film They Call Me Bruce? <laughs> no, it was just a song about... Uh, no, it was just a song about how uh, he was always confused with Bruce Springsteen because the name was similar. Oh, that's... And Bruce Springsteen was an actual star. Although uh, I, there are many late 70s, early 80s panties that were moistened to the tune <laughs> of Rick Springfield's Jesse's Girl. That's right. You know, I'm not going to do that Wolfman Jack voice anymore because uh, most does that people nece- have turned Does it, that necessitate me stopping the Casey? No, Casey. you can go on with Casey as long as you like. Oh, don't tempt me, Frodo. I'll just... Pre- Though I would use the ring for good through me, it would wield a power great and terrible and slightly effeminate. Terrible. All right, we are back. Yeah, we're back. Welcome back. You know, this was the first time I think we've ever done this. We listened to the story before we did the show. 
Yeah, they happened to arrive on our doorstep yesterday. So Rish was asking me questions about it before we started to record. And so it's I said, called well, pre-show prep. Yes. Yeah, I said, well, why don't we check it out? And so I pushed play on there and we wound up sitting and listening to the entire 38 minutes or whatever it was. <laughs> Holding hands in the dark. Yes. Poetry in motion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Science! The, yeah, and the reason I wanted to hear it is I was going to ask you who read the story. The narrator's voice is uh, actually read by R.E. Chambliss. Who, wait, wait, wait a second. Why, why is that name familiar? That might be because she's the one person that still likes us. Oh, okay. Exa- uh, yes. Thank that you, Renee. That one, yeah. Am I allowed to say Renee? I think you can Can I call say... you Renee? Can, would, would you prefer I call you Renee? I think you must call her R.E.C. Okay. There's a Spanish horror film called R.E.C. Really? Huh. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we are, of course, killing time. I'm flipping the records. The ears are LPs. And my other hand is stroking Jean. <laughs> yes, Jean Kasem, my you just, wife. You just won't let the Jean Kasem thing go, will you? You just got to flaunt that you're the only person that knows that she ever existed. I'm so sorry, folks. We'd see, I don't believe we have a robot companion today, and uh, and that's why this terrible, terrible stuff that would normally be cut out is in the episode. You have no idea how many hours we've whiled away doing Casey Kasem voices, <laughs> Wolfman Jack voices. Uh, we both did Pee Wee Herman, dueling Pee Wees one time, and it wasn't just, you know, in the men's room oh. for once. And uh, <laughs> it all gets cut out before we hit the air. Oh, you wouldn't want to hear dueling Pee Wees going, I know you are, but what am I? Whew. Okay, so yeah, Elliot Bangs. I think that's a pseudonym. It is a pseudonym. His his real name, Jonathan Bangs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Elliot. Okay, so a m- long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, uh-huh. uh, a long time ago, you said that we might do a whole month of time travel stories, and this was going to be on the docket. Yeah, it uh, it was one of the ones that I was thinking for. In the end, I wound up just dispersing them over the next uh, little while. So this is the first. Is it the first? We haven't done a- another time travel story recently, well, we, have we? we did the Cory Doctorow. Oh, right, right. Okay, well, that one was never meant to be included in the month. I think that was when I mentioned that we were thinking of doing a time travel month Okay. in the first place. It just wouldn't work out to get them all together at the same time. Well, we try and switch things up. We try right. not to have two horror stories next to each other or two fantasy stories or, right, yeah. or fantasy stories or, or any poetry at all or, or <laughs> sci-fi stories next to each other. You know, things like that. Right, right. Yeah, that's the other thing that I was going to mention. Maybe it would be cool to do a themed month, but yeah, we always try and keep it switched up. Since we do different kinds of stories, we're not just a sci-fi podcast or a fantasy podcast or whatever. We try and always have something different for you. We don't even limit ourselves to good stories, actually. Yeah, that's true. We did that one uh, Naughty or Nice by Rich Outfield that one time. That's right. Never again, folks. <laughs> we have the Naughty or Nice memorial so that we never forget. <laughs> so anyways, that's why uh, I kind of decided we'd just go ahead and go with this one now. And on top of that, we had Brian Lincoln do the story for us this time around. He produced the episode, and the guy's good, and he's quick, and so it's done way before I ever would have gotten around to any time travel month. If it's at all interesting, where did this story come from? <laughs> Not at all interesting, no. This story I read on Strange Horizons. I was reading it over there and I thought, gosh, this story's so good. Figured I'd see if uh, Elliot would be interested in uh, letting us do the story. And he was, so here it is. Oh, well, he ruined that decision, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, and not just because of the Jonathan Banks comment, <laughs> which we've edited out three times, and you're here and it again. <laughs> okay, to me this was a real nice surprise, because I believe you printed the story out and said, we're doing this story, read it. <laughs> That's right. And so I started it and thought, oh, geez. You know, I, I didn't want to like the story, because I'm one of those people that if you tell me I have to like Kung Fu Panda, I won't do it. I was like, no, I won't like it. And uh, I, I had to like it. It was so cool. And I love time travel, as you know. We talk about this on the show all the time. And this was a very unique yeah. time travel idea. You know, it's it's told from the girl's perspective, woman's perspective. Do we ever get an age on the main character? I don't think so. No, but I get the feeling that she's similar in age to uh, our guy who they do say died at 30. So okay. she's in their 20s somewhere. I, I think that still counts as being a woman. But you could still call her a girl. She's not a girl, but not yet a woman. And no more singing, Rish. 
No. I think I had a point, but I don't remember. Oh, okay. So I read the story and I said, oh, I agree. This is, yes, we are doing this story, but what are we going to do about these songs? And uh, I think we had one of those slap fights that you sometimes <laughs> see on the Oxygen Network. And uh, well, my, my point of view was, well, he mentions she blinded me with science right there. We got to play it. I'm becoming Wallace Shawn. Inconceivable. We got to play. She blinded me with science. It's like, okay. And so I, I took that print out and I annotated it. Where, what song, and, you know, just a bunch of songs from 84 that I knew and when they would start and which talking head song I was going to use and all that. And then you and I had this slap fight, cat fight, knock down, drag out, fight in the supermarket about it. And I tossed my notes after that when you said, no, we can't play something that belongs to somebody. And for some reason, you became an old man when you said it belongs to somebody else. And Clarence, I want to live. And so I was so upset that I was like, die, we're not doing this story. Okay, none of these things happened except for the slap fight and the old man voice (laughs) and me annotating it and losing the paperwork. And Clarence was there. Right. He did get his wings. Attaboy, Clarence. (laughs) Because the story... Story made the show in the end. Zuzu's pedals were right there. There's, oh, wait. There you. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. So we had this argument, and I, I don't know if it was an impasse or a standstill or a, a tie or any of these things. <laughs> But then Brian... A draw. It was a draw. But Brian took the story and he just went ahead and did it, which rendered the whole argument moot because whatever he did sort of overruled ours. And I think Brian erred on the side of caution, whereas I would have... This would have been a friggin' Billboard 1984 <laughs> greatest hits had I been editing this thing. And you would have been like, oh, I know. I thought, wow, it was 84. I, th- I thought Whitney Houston's first album didn't come out until it... And, you know... Uh, he chose to do these little snippets, mm-hmm. but we got our Talking Heads song and we got our Blinded Me With Science. I believe I even say science the same time that Thomas Dolby <laughs> yeah, that, does. that worked out cool. You know, I think what Brian was going for and what, you know, we talked and I, I think when we were having the slap fight, I was trying to bring this point up to you is there's something called fair use where you can use a very small snippet of something to illustrate or comment upon uh you know something and i don't know maybe we'll get a note from a lawyer here in no time flat saying you better take that show down or else we're going to take your house and your car and everything else that belongs to you including your children and sell them off and use that to enrich our fat cat music this is a sony lawyer you're talking <clears throat> yeah, about yes yes you know maybe that'll happen who knows but i believe that we're safe in the very small amount of each song that we use it's not like i'm a lawyer and that i understand really how fair use works but though you do play one on tv i do actually yeah i'm not a douchebag but i play one <laughs> And yeah, I, why, we're not going to. Why did you do that in the Casey Case voice? <laughs> because I love that voice. We're not going to get into it on the air, but I mean, right. it's just we have to agree to disagree. There's a thousand other podcasts you're probably listening to rather than us right now that play entire songs underneath whatever they want, and That's they have true. thousands more listeners than our biggest have ever had. Yeah, I Any, think, but I will stop talking. I think what they figure is that there's no way in hell anybody is listening to them. But they know they have thousands of listeners, you know. Where yeah. We we have six listeners, and if one of them works for Sony, then, well... The good thing about audio is you can't just get on Google and search through the content of a podcast. And Google then call somebody's and employer and have them fired? Right. Okay. Google can't search through that, whereas they can do that on blogs and other stuff that uh, may be ripping someone off or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, there's that. Okay. This is not an invitation for people in the comments to talk about fair use or what you can do or what one podcast does and gets away with them, why they get away with it and why we couldn't. Yeah. I don't want to know. I'm Rich just... will go absolutely bug f***y, batch f***y, crazy. If... Indeed, I will. In fact, I'm just <laughs> looking for an excuse. I'm one of those. Remember the whole slap fight? Yeah, I mean, all I did was just mention the words fair use. Oh, and... you mother man <laughs> and it was endless and i was just like dude really it was it wasn't so much a slap fight as it was rish going 
on and on and on about how the world is unfair. And well, I called into the question the parentage of your children. Yeah, let, let's I, just keep that out of the comments because uh, it won't be pretty. And hey. yeah, what Brian's attitude was, well, if 900 other podcasters jumped off a cliff, then your ratings would probably go up. There you go. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the story for the two people. Hi, Wendy. For the two people that are still listening. <laughs> Time travel, awesome, cool, 1984, awesome. pinnacle of cool. society. You know, I don't know if 1984 can count as the pinnacle because your favorite movie of all time... Came back out three years before? ...is Back to the Future, which came out in 1985. So if that's the pinnacle of all the world, then we miss out on that. But I could go to L.A., and maybe work on Back to the Future. Well, there's that. I could I keep trying, <laughs> go E through 84 again and again. And he's like, what? Zemeckis just won't take my resume <laughs> until finally I'm there. I'm the guy in the 50s scene who smells Lorraine's hair when she turns and says, isn't he a dream boat? <laughs> go back and watch it. That's me. That's you? Oh. So okay, maybe. If you, if you have one year and you can tell me why or you can refuse to tell me why and I'll call you a butt licker. Okay. So just right now, at the top of your head, what year would you pick as your repeat year? That's really hard to, to just pull off the top of my head. I might pick like 1991 or 92 because that was when I was a senior in high school. And you got to repeat that first time I read Lord of the Rings experience. Yeah, I, I, got, I, I could read it over and over again. That's, yeah. That Tom Bombadil stuff? <laughs> oh, Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadillo. Blue is his shirt, and his pants are yellow. Oh, dear <laughs> Lord. <laughs> oh, Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadillo. This is our last episode, folks, <laughs> just so you know. That's off the point, isn't it? Um, Ni 1991? Right, yeah, I was thinking 91 or 92. I don't know why. Maybe just because that See, was the time that I was coming in from adolescence into adulthood or something hmm. like good memories from those times so i don't know that that would be worth going back to those years because what are you going back to the year for are you going back because you love the pop culture of the time or are you going back because you want to see the berlin wall get torn down again soul cages came out in 91 all right see there you go nirvana came out in 91 i think too i'm sure you were listening to them when bleach came out and then when nevermind came Oh, yeah, you have no use for them cool anymore. Already. I don't know. What what year would you pick? I hate to say it. I'm, I was thinking 91 as well. Although, oh, yeah? for me, summer of 77 is so romantic because I didn't experience that. The whole right. Star Wars uh, right. phenomenon. Oh, so are we talking Star Wars with again? And, and I had a coworker that I worked with that was about 10, 15 years older than me or whatever. And I would always ask him to tell me about... Jaws summer of 75 or, or when Star Wars came out and he always wanted to talk about when Xanadu came out for some reason. <laughs> that, that movie was offensive to gay people. He, oh, is it that same guy? Yeah, but <laughs> that he, movie was offensive to any people. I'm sorry. I saw that movie an awful lot because, you know, I had older brothers and sisters and watching them roller skate around in that freaking rink and sing Xanadu and clap their hands. Xanadu. Oh my gosh, that movie Xanadu. was just hideously awful. Singing. And yet it was a big enough deal that they wanted to watch it again and again anyways. Ugh. See, I thought that movie represented the death knell of <laughs> disco music. Probably did. And for that reason, it should be remembered. I'm, I'm not a fan of disco. So that 77 thing would be really rough. Right. They're like, why, why don't you just wear jeans? What the hell? <laughs> Button up the, the shirt, please. Just just one more button. the one-piece outfit. I mean, come on. Yeah, I remember that when Michael Jackson died a few years. Was that? Um, Did you just say a few years ago? I was going to say a few years, and then I had to stop and think, when was that? But that was almost exactly a year ago since he died. But then they pulled out all these old video of him and started showing it all over TV. And there was this shot of Michael Jackson coming out, and he's got the full-blown afro going. And he's got this one-piece, bell-bottom, powder blue freaking, it's got the Dazzler sequins jumpsuit. on it, jumpsuit. And he comes out, and he's doing his dancing. And I was just like, holy crap! How did people live with themselves in the 70s? I don't know. Really Cocaine! I guess. It must have been an awful lot of it. There's something about the 70s that just freaks me out a lot. It's intimidating. Because, yeah, all of that stuff was embarrassing. I, You know, I, I grew up in the 80s and the 90s, and... In the 90s, the 70s was suddenly hip again and all yeah. that crappy music was popular. And 
the generation that was just younger than me was all into that. You know, they, they had like all these super hits of the 70s compilation CDs and stuff. Shaft and came back in and all well, that. Sh- they mother. say that cat Shaft is a bad mother. <laughs> Shut your mouth. But, 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 I'm, I'm talking about Shaft. For me, that was just that. All that stuff was so eye rollingly, embarrassingly <laughs> bad. Yeah. But for the kids in the nineties, it was the eighties that was it that was, way, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so because it was just there'd be like all oh, eighties hair. You had poofy hair, and girls had makeup on. And I was like, "You have hair and makeup on. What is the difference?" So it was like you had shoulder pads, and he's like, "Yeah, but you don't have any shoulders at all." I guess that's just always the way it is. My wife was just talking about this because she works at work. There's a bunch of people that she has to deal with. They're like 18, 19 years old. Oh, dear Lord. I can't even imagine. And she'll talk to these people and they'll look back at things like the Backstreet Boys. And they don't look back at it as like, oh, my gosh, it was that terrible crap. And, you know, so embarrassingly awful. I liked the back. But, yeah, they look back at it. They remember those songs from their their childhood and it's like oh yeah you remember that one i want it that that's the one they'll dance and sing and talk about these songs as though they weren't ridiculed and reviled by the time that they ran their course the same way that disco was when it had finished running its course it's just strange for me to even imagine that having been a person that was like nine years old or something when Backstreet Boys were cool. And someday my kids are going to grow up and they're going to look back at Hannah Montana and instead of talking about the uh, horrible spiral that her life became as she went down and down and down and then burst into flames, which actually hasn't completely happened yet. It's just barely begun. They'll talk about it like it's, it was something special and wonderful or something. It's just a weird thing to me for some reason. Life is weird. Right. The, the whole passage of time thing, the, the ever-present march of time is so strange. And, and, and I was having a conversation with my uncle yesterday who's, I don't know, let's say 62 or 3. And he was just talking about his childhood and how different things were. And I made a couple comments about the 50s. And he's like, no, no, that wasn't in the 50s. And I'm like, that's what the 50s is. You know, like the poodle skirts and television in every living room. You know, that's what we think of as the 50s. And and yeah, and Leave it to Beaver. And he's like, no, no, no. Nobody ever watched Leave it to Beaver. And, I was, and nobody ever sat around a television set in their living room. It's like nobody went to the hop and danced around a jukebox <laughs> and all this. And I just like, whoa, what the hell? And maybe if I went to 77 three guys saw star wars on the 25th of may it's true i mean isn't that how that worked i mean didn't star wars just build and build and build and well i don't know the way we look back at it the lines were around the block and yeah, but Steven it was Spielberg and George Lucas were in Hawaii and they heard the cheering from all the way <laughs> from in L.A. where it was showing at the Grauman's Chinese. That's that's the myth that has built up, you know <laughs> right. what I mean? Of just, you know, this movie changed film forever. But you know, if you look at the cover of Variety for that day or whatever, it's just like, you know, American Graffiti Guy made a terrible movie today. It, it's just with the years, with perception... You know, okay, at the end of this story, she wants to go back and check out the Beatles. And think if you really went to when the Beatles first appeared on Ed Sullivan, think of all the adults and all of the people like my dad that would have been (laughs) like, God, music is terrible. That's not going to go anywhere. You, You can get a haircut. You know what I mean? There's that guy that famously did not sign the Beatles to his record label because he thought guitar bands had run their course and they were going to go away. And people didn't want to hear that anymore. And here we are. I guess guitar bands have run their course now because it's all just hip hop anymore. Well, see, I don't know. There's the footage, the famous footage of the screaming girls and, and all that. But that might not have been the norm. Right. You know, there may have been hundreds of thousands of people watching Ed Sullivan at home that were like, huh, I, I want to hold your hand. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, maybe I'm going to go to the bathroom now. They, they, they weren't impressed at all. And, right. and I'm not saying that that's the truth. I'm just saying that we have a mythology built around the Beatles appearing on Ed Sullivan or, or Beatlemania and all that stuff the same way that there is around Star Wars, like you were saying. 
well, so, and so other I things. Don't, I wouldn't want to really go back and live 77 over and over and over again because to me that's kind of an unknown quantity. Right. I would want to go to a year that I knew, like 91, like 85, something like that. Also, the, with this character, the, the guy who was living over and over and over again, he, it said that he had done his homework. He knew all about history. I would assume that he didn't have a job, that all he had to do was know who was going to win the Super Bowl, was right. know what stocks were going to take a giant leap upward. You know, when that Macintosh commercial hit, wasn't that 84? I think it was, in the Super Bowl In the Bowl Super Bowl or whatever. And think of how the stock for Apple would have went after that million dollar Ridley Scott commercial, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. You know, just these these things that we talk about. I'm not a stoner, but it's a sort of those stoner conversations where three hours go by and you're still talking about, no, 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 man, because they didn't think E.T. was going to be hit, man. You know, and you're just like, that was two years ago. I, I find that really romantic. Uh, romance sort of way. Right. Romantic in the my life sort of way of just looking and saying, oh, I'd like that. Just to live the same year over and over again. Now, if you hated Reaganomics, if you hated the, the fashion of the 80s, I love the neon clothes and the, the white pants and the white matching jacket. He's not kidding. No he's he's wearing a members only the, jacket right now. You know, I, I love that stuff. I even liked the hairstyles that people make fun of. Maybe not the flock of seagulls one, but... But you did have a mohawk. On my scrotum. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, no, I didn't have that. But yeah, it's, it just... I'm I'm a big 80s nostalgia buff. Even if there was Alf and Mr. Belvedere around that time. Oh, that was the worst theme song for it. I can't, we did a whole episode and we didn't even mention that, did we? <laughs> well, it was meant to be in the episode. It got it was, cut out. It was after. We were like, we're done. We're just like, oh, wait, we forgot the worst song ever. Oh, wait, we were doing best theme songs. <laughs> no, because we both picked MASH for number oh, one. Oh, that's right. MASH was the worst theme song. We were doing worse. Oh. Oh, dude, okay, hey, I'm going to say it on the air. We've got to do another top five or top ten <laughs> list thing, okay? Okay, good thing you said that on the air because no, no, you I'm just, haven't said it on the air before. I'm just saying that somebody in the comment section might recommend it. Like, oh, hey, how okay. about if you guys do top yeah. this and got, then we do it? Or they could also say, hey, you guys were going to do that and you also were going to talk about uh, – in your pants in the testing center and you never did that <laughs> how many donations did we need to get to tell it and how many to not tell it uh, we needed two to tell it or three or more to not tell it. there you go <laughs> i'm sorry I, I i do like the story i hope elliot doesn't well yeah, i'm sure he's turned it off by now yeah i should have thanked him at the very beginning for letting us do a story maybe we can edit it around and put it at the start nope too late we don't have a droid today ah uh. But I need the droid to bleep out the F word. Fuck you. <laughs> Is that what it was? Yeah. What, I was uh, quoting two stories in a row. What did you want to talk about? I'm sorry. Was there anything interesting about the story or the character or me trying to do a drunk voice or the girl's voice? or? I like the way the story was done a lot. You know, it sounded really nice. It sounded very professional. It sounded better than a Doom Steve story normally does. Say what? I really thought that it was impressively well done. I even liked my own performance in that. That's doesn't, rare. Yeah, that doesn't happen very often. Damn I thought it was a... I like it, folks. I didn't say nothing. Keep going. <laughs> manja, manja. I can, I can see that Brian is definitely getting better with each story that he produces. And this one uh, is just really good. That's funny because every time we have a conversation on the air, it's slightly worse than the yeah. last one. I think work. this is the pinnacle. <laughs> Until next week. Take Time travelers pinnacle. in the future will come back to this episode <laughs> over and over again and say, you know, it never got any worse than this episode. Are you sure about that, Casey? Are <laughs> <laughs> you speedwagon? I can't fight this feeling any longer. I, I don't think that's the actual song title. I believe it is. Think, would you stop doing that for the love of God? <laughs> oh, yes. This is the worst episode ever. You have proven it, it now. It doesn't get much more <laughs> shitty than this. <laughs> Two. So, um, Elliot, if you're still here, thank you for sharing this story with us. Yes, it uh, if was, this was your, great. If this is your first professional sale, 
you know, I hope you're not uh, one of those guys, you know, Boston never had a bigger hit than their first album. I hope it's onward and upward for you and, and that this must be the place isn't your 1984. <laughs> nah. Jeez, I can't stop pounding that into the ground. <laughs> I definitely agree with that. I will look forward to all the rest of the uh, good stuff you've got in That's store right. for I us. can't wait to listen to your work on a real podcast. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Brian. You pulled our fat out of the... I don't know. I'm still pretty fat. Okay, hey, before we end the show, uh-huh. uh, you've got something to unveil. On, <laughs> on the... No, no, not that. Put, sit, sit back down. <laughs> you've got something to unveil for the listener. Oh, that. Or or mention. Maybe unveil is the wrong word. Well, that might be a little strong for what we've got. Usually when you unveil something, it's something really neat. Oh, okay. Well, you have something to present. No, nope, that may be That might be a little more, well. too. You have something to mention to our listeners. <laughs> I have something to admit to. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. We have set up a Dune Steve blog that you can visit to get all the news and info that might come along with the blog. Rish and I both can get on there at any time and just write something up. We'll probably keep it generally to show type things, right? Is that the plan? Or Well, we had a long stretch there where we weren't doing any episodes or, or no episodes were getting on. And the only way to let people know that we were still out there would be either Facebook. And I know you do Twitter, but I don't. Or I kept wanting to go on there and, and make a post on the main page and say, hey, we've got an episode. It's almost done. We've not gone away. We've not. What's that phrase? Pod fade. We haven't done that. But we'd sort of decided that the main page should always just be about episodes unless it's, you know, submissions are reopening or submissions are closing or we were finally going off the air and finally done with this damn <laughs> thing. And it's about bloody time. Have we pounded that one into the ground? <laughs> but I just thought it would be cool if we could get on and I could say, hey, this is what we're doing in an episode. Or we just recorded this thing and it was really cool. Or I got my niece to do you know, an evil voice. We played with the echo and, and it was so scary my nuts went away or something like that. You know, it just... I thought your nuts went away in 1975, that one accident. I got better. <laughs> well, that's good. So there's that. You can check it out. There's a button right over on the right side, kind of right next to the donate buttons and the uh, various other buttons that we've placed on our site over the years. But if somebody's iTunesing this, is that a verb? Yeah, pretty much everything's a verb once you put an ING on the end of it these days. uh, What's the URL? It's just doonsteef.blogspot.com if you want to go to the blog itself. And, And, uh, yeah, you can sign up to it like you do with any blog where you get on the RSS feed or however that stuff works. I'm really not smart enough to figure it out myself. But, you know, if you are, you can do that. If you have questions for us or uh, something that you want us to talk about, I think that's probably a good place. Just because the the recording process is kind of complicated sometimes aren't able to get together and all that it would just but it's so easy just to type something and hit publish and there's your answer you wouldn't have to wait a month to find out or six months in the dune steve's case (laughs) to find out the answer to your question yeah so we've got our first thing up there aside from our first post there is now a set of pictures oh right wait have you put those up there already Uh uh-huh oh okay i i went to comic-con recently and my camera is awesome no, the other thing. Oh. For some reason, pictures just don't always come out. Or maybe they only come out a third of the time. And, and I took pictures of some of the people at the panels, you know, celebrities that I saw. And then when I got home and stuck them on my computer, more than half of them were just unusable. <laughs> and then there were some that were totally unrecognizable. <laughs> and so I think I sent you a couple and I said, guess who this is? Guess who this is? And you're just like, I, are these people? <laughs> so I came up with the idea of let's make a game out of it. Let's post 10 or 15 pictures on the site. And the person who can identify the most of these pictures, you know, these are celebrities, by the way. They're not just, oh, hey, there's that fat girl in the Princess Leia costume again. I, it should be somebody recognizable. Uh, even though you can't recognize them in the photo. And the first person who... I would say the person who could identify the most or the first person who can get them all correct will win. Is that possible? 
you looked at them and you didn't. I didn't even come close. No, and there were some of them where I was like, oh, I know who this is. And then I was totally wrong. And then later I realized, oh, dude, I suck. That was this person instead. I got a couple of free t-shirts, maybe. Oh, that's right. That's what was going to be your plan, wasn't it? Some of your shh. Oh, wait, sorry. There's no H in it. Swag. Now, why do I say swag and, and you ma- mock me for that? Or, or are you not mocking I'm not mocking you. I Everybody is, uh, I think maybe it's just because of the proliferation of Yiddish in uh, American society. People just want to add that sh- swag, which stands for stuff we all get. Kind of lame once you find out what it really means. <laughs> but, it's better for the secret to read. Yeah, it is. It's like, oh, what could this word mean? It's Yiddish for stuff we all get, folks. I, I got a couple of t-shirts. Uh, I think I can give one away. What's the best way for them to guess? To send an email? Yeah, I think they Not need to the send comments, an email. Right? Don't put it in the comments because that'll help. Help your adversary. Yeah, that will help the other people that are uh, trying to also guess it. So uh, definitely send it in an email to editor at dunesteef.com and we'll uh, look them over and tell you just how poorly you did. Okay, so that sounds good, I hope. All right. Anything else? I don't think so. We don't do quotes, so we're done, man. Okay. Well, good night. Yeah, see and you later, folks. Have you ever heard the joke about the two baseball playing brothers that love anal rape? <laughs> That's my favorite joke. This is why you don't have a Parsec award, Rish. All right. See you later, folks. <laughs> You're going to... Thanks for listening. The Dune Steef is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Take two. You know, I might pick like 1991 or 92 because that was when I was a senior in high school and reading Lord of the Rings. Yes, I I could read it over and over again. That's yeah. You know what's the worst part is I admit it right now. I put my hand in the air. I have not read Lord of the Rings. Wait, what? I listened to the Lord of the Rings though, and Tom Bombadil is sung the whole way through. That guy, oh Tom Bombadil. Tom Bombadillo. Boy, I tell you what, every time one of those songs would come up, and there's a fair number of songs in those books, and yeah, the guy would just... Fair? There's an unbelievable <laughs> amount of friggin' songs. Yeah, that's what that phrase means. Oh. Um, there's a lot of songs, and he sang every one of them and just came up with something. And he was kind of an older gentleman. I'm not sure who it was that was reading it. But... A queen. <laughs> It was always like, no, 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 the whole way through. And I was just like, oh, somebody shoot me. It was almost as bad as listening to an entire episode of our show. That hurts. <laughs> la di da, la di da, la di da. La di friggin' da. <laughs> See what this dude is. Who am I playing? Oh, from your delivery, a douche? Uh, His name was Bud. Bogus. I know that place. They exclaim it through a mouthful of soggy cocoa pops if you can. <laughs> um, Here, here's a, a wad of used toilet paper. Oh, thank you. Now you're a younger <laughs> version of you and you're dancing. Wait, that song didn't come out for four more years. Dang. Burp. I don't have anything to drink. You burp. I I just burped before we started recording and it's gone now. Shoot, I'm sorry, Brian. Can you can you suck in air and then burp like some guys in high school could do and then recite the ABCs? No, but I can fart with my armpit and my the palm of my hand. Oh, that'll work. Maybe we can just do that. What do you know? Hold on a sec. Is it doing that thing again? Sing it with me. Take me home tonight, motherfucker. I don't want to let you go. Never. Wait. I've locked my mic now. Why can't you like any money? Just for a little while. Because he's bad. He's terrible. That's why it's obvious.
It's poetry in motion, and now she's making love to me. That's Jean once again. Thank you, dear. Just to make sure I get that right, let me pop that up. That's what she said. <laughs> Wait. What? Now, we what? thought it was Renee Chamblay. Yeah, that's what the R stands for, is Renee. What the R stands for. <laughs> <laughs> Roger Subirano oh, has no. dropped off the countdown this week, sadly. Uh, Elliot that. Bangs. <laughs> he had to change it to Jonathan Bangs for the porno <laughs> career. <laughs> really? That's, so no kissing or foreplay of any kind? It's a prison story. Ah, believe me, I've dropped this soap too many times to count. <laughs>